Hello. Hi. Welcome to Planet Texas 2050's annual symposium, Resilience Research in Action. I'm Dr. Heidi Schmalbach, the program director of Planet Texas 2050. And I'm Jonathan Lowell, the program coordinator. Nice to see you. On behalf of the Symposium Planning Committee and the Theme Organizing Committee of Planet Texas 2050, thank you all for taking the time to join us today. And we hope that you'll stay with us for tomorrow and Thursday as well. For those of you who might not be familiar with Planet Texas 2050, we are one of three research grand challenges at the University of Texas at Austin. Our mission is to advance interdisciplinary research on climate resilience and to co-design adaptive strategies for climate resilience with frontline communities and other partners across Texas. Um, we wanted to stand up here and show you our faces because, um, of course, attending the symposium is a great way to learn more about what we do. You can also go to our website, which is planettexas2050 at utexas.edu. If you would like to learn how to get more involved in Planet Texas 2050, how to partner with us, please find one of the two of us over the next few days. Talk to us. You can always send us an email, but we're really happy to welcome you into this network if you're not already involved and happy to talk to you about how you can get more involved with us. Jonathan has a few housekeeping items to go over, and then we will introduce our speaker. So if you haven't grabbed lunch, it is to the left here, or back here in the Black Box Theater. And uh, we are trying to be a zero waste event. Um, so everything on your plate, including your plate and your silverware and your cups are all compostable. Currently, uh, the bins have not arrived. <laughs> Um, so, if you, to the extent that you, to the extent that you feel comfortable, just hold on to your plates, and then hopefully they should arrive within the within the hour. Hopefully, um, um, yes. So every, uh, everything you can throw away into that green bin as soon as it comes. Um, and bathrooms are straight out this door, first right, and then right again. Those are where the bathrooms are. And welcome again. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Um, before I'm going to pass the mic, I want to thank Dr. Jonathan Foley for traveling this afternoon to be with us, and of course to all of the participants for sharing your expertise over the next few days. It's sure to be a rich and very interactive event. Um, I want to thank the Symposium Planning Committee, which includes Paula Pasalacqua, Katie Brown, and Katie Dawson for helping us select and organize content for this week. And a huge thank you to our event staff, especially Lloyda Martinez, who works tirelessly. She was here this weekend and last night, making sure that most everything is in line, ready to go for today. And um, we just couldn't do this without our fabulous events team. And now I would like to introduce our wonderful boss, the architect of the Bridging Barriers Grand Challenge Initiative, and just a great supporter of interdisciplinarity and collaboration, um, the Deputy Vice President for Research, Dr. Jennifer Liongardner. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, everybody, for showing up this afternoon um, and committing to being indoors on uh, otherwise great day outside. But um, great to see everyone. I left my iPad in my car, so I got to look at remarks off this little tiny phone. Um, <clears throat> so uh, for those of you that maybe are unfamiliar, this is your first time engaging with the Planet Texas 2050 Research Grand Challenge. I wanted to tell you a little bit of its origin story um, and why we do it and maybe brag a little bit about some of the key um, highlights of the past year before we get into this, um, into the showcase and all of its events, which, which is going to feature more than 75 of our faculty, researchers, students giving presentations and leading discussions, um, as well as um, several of our external partners and some of our key external partnerships um, with artists and other and other non-UT folks. So the impact is a lot, a lot farther than the university. So Planet Texas 2050 was originally conceived um, almost eight years ago now. Uh, in the spring of 2016, the president of the university at the time had asked uh, my boss, the vice president for research, who was then brand new, um, and me, brand new to the role of kind of overseeing institutional capacity building strategy um, for us to try to network our scholars together across all the silos of colleges and departments and disciplines so that we could go farther 
with our research and its impact. Um, and that, that sort of vision has carried through to our current university president um, and UT's current strategic plan. So that's kind of persisted. Um, when my boss and I were thinking about, you know, embodying that, the breaking down of silos and bringing people together and kind of packaging that into the vehicle of a research grand challenge, which is a multi-year focused sprint toward trying to address a major societal challenge by bringing all the resources and expertise that the university has to bear. We knew that it would be critical for the grand challenges to really be led from the bottom up. So we have three uh, research grand challenges. PT 2050 is one of three. And uh, for all three, the topics were entirely driven by the faculty, the scholarly community on our campus. Um, many of those original um, believers, the original planeteers, are still on the steering committee today, are still working with the Grand Challenge and leading many of its efforts um, all these years later, which I think is a true testament to um, you know, to having that buy-in from the very beginning. So this was not something that came from the top down, from deans or presidents saying, hey, why don't you guys do something on climate change? Um, this was a groundswell of faculty and researchers' efforts saying, like, we need to work on this together, and we have really unique expertise to combine to do so. Um, so we've done that, and that's brought us today to a network of a couple hundred scholars across nearly every college and school on this campus. Their students, their postdocs, um, a lot of key research staff, some of our major research support units like the Texas Advanced Computing Center, UT Libraries, um, and others, um, the Office of Sustainability, and then many, many external partners. Our external partnerships are one of the things we're most proud of. We have lots of partnerships in the Rio Grande Valley and Southeast Texas um, with artists and creators. And that matters to us because it tells us that what we're doing you know, has impact beyond scholarly papers or maybe just kind of furthering an ac academic discussion, but really bringing, bringing what we're learning to communities to help improve their situation as we're all facing you know, an increased frequency of extreme weather events. We're currently in that season of Texas of you know, alternating 70 degree days and ice storms before we go to blue bonnet season and then to extreme heat <laughs> before we go back to ice storms. And so that combined right with the massive population growth and influx into our state really makes Texas a bellwether for all the cascading hazards of climate change that we might expect to see as a global community in the coming years. And I'm very proud that Planet Texas 2050 is at the forefront of thinking about how we address this. Um, PT 2050 has continued to build and maintain collaborative relationships um, throughout the process, and we've seen this culminate in a couple key achievements this year. Uh, one is um, we've launched a UT City of Austin Climate Collab within the past year. Um, this is the first of its kind partnership. It's a model town and gown partnership to provide accessible and actionable climate data to municipal departments in our city so we can have direct benefit in the community where we live um, to help them with their planning, help them with their decision making. The collab is supported by City of Austin um, under City Manager Allison Alter and also by Congressman Lloyd Doggett. Another major achievement we've had in the past year is the launch of um, a, the Southeast Texas Urban Integrated Field Lab, which was funded through a multi-million dollar U.S. Department of Energy grant, and our PT2050 chair, Paula Pasalacqua, is the PI of this. Um, that looks at the, com the combined hazards of air pollution and flooding that are happening in the Beaumont, Port Arthur area in Southeast Texas. Many of our PT2050 scholars are co-PIs on this grant. It really is... Um, a shining example of the kind of large-scale community-engaged research that we can do when we all come together and we persist and stick with this as a team for several years. Um, it was a lot of work. I see that as you know a product of the commitment to working together and learning a language across disciplines um, that everyone has demonstrated by sticking with this grand challenge for so many years. So thank you again to everyone. And for being here today, we look forward to sharing uh, more about those two particular highlights and then what else we've been doing um, over the next couple of days. So that concludes my remarks. Um, I am happy now to welcome to the podium um, our faculty chair of Planet Texas 2050, Dr. Paula Pasalacqua. She is a professor in the Massey Department of Civil, Architectural, and Environmental Engineering. She is the current chair of Planet Texas 2050. She is also the lead investigator on our um, Southeast Texas Ur Urban Integrated Field Lab. 
So Paula, if you'd like to come up. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks, Jennifer, for the wonderful introduction and also for covering PD 2050. So we were brainstorming on who to bring as keynote speaker. And this is very important for us because we usually try to have a keynote speaker that really embodies the principles that guide our work at PT 2050. So this is where the idea of bringing Dr. John Foley, the executive director of Project Drawdown, came. But there's also a little bit of a personal story. So of course, John is a, is a world-renowned environmental scientist and sustainability expert. He has written books and many papers as an advisor to government. I mean, we have really a leading person in the climate change solution space. But a personal story is that before being where he is, between 2008 and 2014, John was actually at the University of Minnesota, where I was a graduate student. And John had arrived to be the first director, I believe, of the Environmental Science Institute um, at the University of Minnesota. And there was just a lot of talking about John and John's work. Uh, I actually never met him in person at the time, but my PhD advisor, who's very hard to impress, and John can, can speak for that, I think, spoke extremely highly of John. And so as a graduate student, I was really, really impressed by this name and this person. And so through time, of course, I follow his work. And I think what's, what really you know, brings him here, beside my dream as a graduate student to finally meet him, was also the fact that I always felt that John was steps ahead with respect to where the rest of us was. I feel like you were talking about climate change when nobody was talking about climate change, and now you are, have solutions ready and when st we're still like grappling kind of like with the, with the concept. So I always feel like that really resembles a lot with what we try to do with PT 2050, the fact that we always looked at creating a new discipline and looking at solutions for a big challenge that nobody has identified solution yet for, and yet you know we can put our heads together and develop these solutions together. So I feel like John really encompasses all these, all these characteristics. And so there I was, you know, I felt like I was a graduate student again. I sent him a message on LinkedIn and I said, hey, would you come? And I wasn't sure he would, but he actually responded. And so we're really excited to have you here. So please join me in welcoming John Foley to PT2015. Well, I'm guaranteed to let her down uh, very dramatically today. So uh, look at the, is the mic toning down a little bit? Okay, great, thanks. Uh, well, thank you so much for having me here today to be uh, the speaker of this uh, Planet Texas 2050 event. I have to admit, when I heard those words, I didn't quite know what that meant. And I, I told my wife, you know, like, I'm going to speak of this thing called Planet Texas. She said, God, they want to be their own country. Now they want to be their own <laughs> planet now. I mean, God, you get Elon Musk and the ambition level just goes through the roof around here, you know. Um, <clears throat> and also I'd realized I hadn't been to Austin in God, a better part of a decade. And my first trip here was in the 90s. And I seem to come here about every 10 years. And it's like a whole other city every time I come. Uh, it just gets bigger and bigger. It's incredible how much growth has been here, but how the UT has just been such a juggernaut of that kind of innovation and excitement that embodies Austin to the rest of the world. So congratulations on all the amazing success you're having here uh, as a university, as engaged scholars, what I love to see working with community to solve real problems, to kind of get out of the ivory tower and into the real world. Well, because you know the real world needs help. And uh, universities have an awful lot to offer, so uh, thank you for what you're doing. So today, I'm going to be talking a lot about kind of the climate change problem, not so much from the adaptation side, but maybe more on the mitigation side, the idea let's prevent as much of that as we can while we're also adapting and building resilient systems. So very complementary to what you're all talking about this week, and I can't wait to hear more about your work, too. Um, but as we get started here, and I'm trying to get my remote to work. OK, there we go. I want to start off by just kind of reminding us this moment in human history. Uh, you know, we're, we're basically in a race now. We're in a race between two very different versions of the future. One version of the future we hear a lot about is the really kind of crappy one. The one where we don't get it right, where we continue to just pollute and pollute and pollute, and we don't do what we can to stop further climate change from happening. And it goes into the kind of the really bad end of the spectrum of outcomes, where it's a much warmer planet with much more destabilized weather systems, 
with degraded natural resources, with vulnerable people being hit left and right. Yeah, we're seeing the, some of that now, but it could get a lot worse. And this is a future that is still very much on the table. But there's another future, and this is the one I believe in, and this is the one I think all of us in this room want to see too. It's a world where we maybe we get it basically right. Sure, we didn't avoid all climate change, but we avoided the worst of it. Maybe it was too last minute, but we did hear the call. We stood up and did what was necessary to transform the world, to not only prevent the worst aspects of climate change from happening, that I you know, certainly hope we do, but at the same time, we have a chance to build a better world in the process. A world that is not only preventing the worst of climate change, but also is more resilient, maybe more prosperous, maybe more secure, and maybe more equitable. Let's see if we can go build that world, and let's see what it would take to do that. And I really believe we can win this race, but neither outcome is guaranteed here. Neither one is, you know, is certain. Nobody knows. The future is never written in stone. It is what we make it to be. And so this is still a choice, and an active choice, and one we need to lean into and work really, really hard on. But to win this race, we have to get unstuck. Because right now, at least I feel that way. I don't know about the rest of you. But I feel we know what to do, kind of. We know we need to do something, but we're not quite getting there. We're, we're kind of you know, talking a lot, we're getting excited, but somehow we're not really hitting our full stride yet. So what do we need to do to get unstuck? That's what I want to talk to you about this morning and see what we can do to get unstuck and accelerate action to build that better world. But one of the things we can do to build that better future, to guide us along the way, I think is that we need to do several things. First and foremost, I think we need to listen to good science. Um, now, I'm a scientist, so it's a little bit of a bias. A lot of you are too. But scientists and engineers, we, we do have a little good, we, you know, we have a good trick up our sleeves. We use evidence. Because we are flawed human beings. We all have our own biases and hidden assumptions and prejudices and our own life experiences that kind of, kind of shape the way we see the world. So we don't see the world with perfect accuracy. But science forces us to test. Oh, thank you. Uh, forces us to test our assumptions and to retest them and test them again and to put our work into the public you know, domain, to test against peer-reviewed work and so on. So science kind of iterates towards the truth in a way that can be very helpful. So we try not to fool ourselves with our own assumptions. And science can help us here. And of course, science has always been part of the story. And when I think about science solving big problems, I usually think about Matt Damon. Maybe, maybe you do too, I don't know, right? This guy seems to get into all sorts of trouble when it comes to uh, in his life, right? Saving Private Ryan or this or that. Hollywood spent billions of dollars saving this guy's ass. You know, it's really weird, but it's somehow this happens a lot. But in the movie The Martian, how many of you have seen this movie? Probably anybody? Okay. So if you haven't, the idea is Matt Damon is a, an astronaut on Mars with a team, and he's accidentally left behind on Mars all by himself with nothing really to survive. And he has to figure out how to survive you know, another year or two until another mission can come rescue him. And fortunately, he's a scientist. And he says something I thought was actually pretty profound. He said, you just begin. You do the math. You solve one problem, and then you solve the next one, and then the next. And then the best line of the whole movie, of course, is there's only one option. We're going to have to science the blank out of this. <laughs> the same thing's true with climate change. I think we're going to have to science the crap out of this. Okay? We're going to have to use the tools of science and engineering to figure out what to do. Because science, after all, identified the problem back in the 1800s. We now know for a long time that increasing greenhouse gases in the atmosphere warm the planet. That's only because of science. If it, weren't because of, if it weren't for science, we wouldn't know what was happening. We would just know the planet seems to be getting warmer, weather patterns seem to be getting weirder, but we would have no idea why, because it's being caused by an invisible gas. So it's only thanks to science we even understand the problem. Little segue, I do this sometimes. The scientist who first discovered the issue of climate change and the greenhouse effect wasn't who I was told in grad school. When I was in grad school, back in the Cretaceous era, I was told that it was a guy named Joseph Tyndall. Maybe you were too, a British male scientist in the 1860s. Turns out that's not true at all. It's actually an American woman named Eunice Foote in 1853. 
F-O-O-T-E. She should be in every textbook, but she's still not. We still have to fix this. She wasn't given a lot of credit for her work, but she first published the idea that increasing CO2 levels in the atmosphere would warm the planet. She wasn't even allowed to present this at her, the conference. Her husband uh, presented her paper instead. And she really was kind of largely ignored in scientific history. And all the credit went to somebody who published 10 years later, Tyndall. Tyndall, ironically, and with no connection at all, was killed by his wife a couple years after that. <laughs> so I'm <laughs> not sure what that says about him, but probably unrelated. <clears throat> but so let's get the credit right here. Uh, science identified the problem of climate change a whole long time ago, and now we're living in that reality today. But science can also help us with the problem, and it can help us with the solutions too. And God, we need help today when it comes to solutions, because everybody seems to have an answer for climate change. Now that there's money going into climate change, now that there's some attention and political focus on climate change, everybody and their brother, and a lot of the tech bros who've just moved to Austin probably will tell you they've got a solution to climate change. And they're going to be really confident about it and tell you they have the answer with a capital A. Just go on Twitter and ask, what's the solution to climate change? And you're going to hear an earful about what the solutions are. But that's not how it's going to work. It isn't who's shouting loudest who's going to have the best ideas. And in reality, there is no silver bullet to climate change. There's just a lot of silver buckshot. We're going to have to do a lot of different things in a lot of different places all at the same time. And science can tell us how. So the first thing science can tell us is what we need to do. The what is pretty easy in some ways. I like to think about it as a game of chess. It's, we're going to have to look at the entire board here. We're going to have to look at solutions across one side of the board about how to cut emissions, how to remove carbon, and other things we can do to lower the burden of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Most of that's going to be cutting emissions, but a few other things too. Then we have to figure out how do we make solutions scale out into the world, what I call levers. You know, how do we get more of these solutions out there? And that's going to be changes in policy, laws, and regulations, of course. It's going to be financial capital. Lots of money needs to be taken out of some things and deployed to new things. We're going to need new technologies. We're going to need changes in culture. We're going to need changes in business. We're going to need lots of different things. And together, we're going to be playing on this rather large chessboard to solve climate change. And as they say in chess, see the whole board. Right from the opening gambit all the way to checkmate, we've got to get really good at playing all these different squares on this board with very different pieces. So it requires collaboration. It requires multiple disciplines, just like you're seeing here at Planet Texas. So that's one of the things we need to do. But we also need to find what works and test each of the pieces, each of the pieces moves and so on, and see what really actually is effective. That's what my organization, Project Drawdown, is pretty well known for. We've done a lot of reviewing and assessing climate solutions, mainly through like a meta-analysis of all the published literature out there to see, hey, what actually works? So here, for example, are solutions in electricity that we would say work really well. There are solutions in like energy efficiency, but also in renewable energy things that can you know, reduce the demand for electricity and produce it without emitting carbon. So that's the electricity sector, but we need solutions in food, and we needed them in transportation, in buildings, in every sector, and across the whole gamut. And our organization has actually found, let me go back, about 100 solutions that are right here today that work incredibly well to address climate change. They're effective, they exist, they get to gigaton scale, and they work right now. So if people tell you we don't have the solutions to stop climate change, they're completely wrong. Tell them to go to our website, drawdown.org, and we'll tell you all about the ones that are here now. Now, sure, we'd like to welcome more solutions. This pie chart has got lots of room for other stuff. But we do have the solutions we need to stop climate change, and we have the evidence to back it up. You don't have to just take our word for it. This is the word of the entire scientific literature summarized and meta-analyzed so that we can actually guide you with peer-reviewed literature to say, yep, this is what seems to work according to the world's best experts in science and engineering. This is what actually is here and working today. The other thing you hear about climate solutions is maybe they're too expensive. Nope, that's not true either. It turns out if you build a cost curve where you stack up climate solutions from left to right, from cheapest all the way to the most expensive, you find out about 80% of the climate solutions are actually cheaper than the world we have right now. 
they're cheaper than fossil fuels. They're cheaper than polluting industries. They're cheaper than unsustainable agriculture. If you look at a long-term kind of window, yeah, maybe in the first year or two it costs some money, but after about 10 to 20 years, most of these actually save or make you more money, at least 80% of the time. And that last 20%, that's where we need to focus and make those things cheaper and better as well. So climate solutions do exist. They are backed by good evidence from peer-reviewed, analyzed data. But also, they're cheap. They're even cheaper than the world we have now. Why wouldn't you want to do this? This is a really good way to go forward. So climate solutions are abundant. They're evidence-based. They're cheap. And we know a lot about the what of climate action. Science has helped us here, too. But where we were left a little bit stuck, I think, is where science hasn't helped us so much, is the science of how. Science is good at describing problems. It's sometimes good at abstractly defining solutions, but not so good at giving instructions on how to do stuff. That's more the realm of engineering and policy. But we need science to guide us here, too. So go from what to how. The how of climate action often boils down to this graph. This is the big problem graph. The red curve is pollution, greenhouse gases going into the atmosphere. It's a big number. It's about 60 billion tons of CO2 and equivalent gases going into the atmosphere every year. And it's been going up for decades. If we continued on that path along the dotted line, it'd go from bad to worse. So we got to do the opposite thing. We've got to bend the curve and bend it really hard and really fast and get emissions as close to zero as quickly as we possibly can in the next two to three decades. If we do that, if we can follow that curve that bends down, we could maybe stop climate change somewhere between 1.5 degrees of warming and 2 degrees of warming. Somewhere in that range is still very doable. 1.5 might be a little late for that, but 1.6 is still on the table, and 1.7, and the lower we keep it, the better off we're all going to be. But it's kind of inevitable that we're not going to get all the emissions. Not in a democracy, anyway, because every sector of the economy in every country in the world doing everything we do today, there'll probably still be some very hard to abate emissions happening even in the 2050s. They might be a little bit in agriculture. They might be a little bit in steel or cement or whatever. I think we'll fix the power problem. That's easy. It's all these other weird little emitting sources that we're going to have a hard time getting rid of even by 2050. This is where the idea of carbon removal comes in. That's the green curve. The idea is if we can cut emissions drastically by like 95%, maybe we can absorb the last 5 to 10% with either nature or machines. But we're not doing that right now. Carbon capture, carbon removal is something of a myth, at least in terms of the atmosphere as a whole. Yes, there are machines that can do this. Trees can do it and do do this. But they aren't really scaled up yet and not permanent enough and not large enough to make a big difference. Even if we took all the industrial carbon capture in the world, the machines that do carbon capture, and if we multiply their size by a million fold, you still couldn't see this on that graph right now. That's how far away we are from scaling up carbon removal. But given a couple decades, maybe by the 2040s, we'll get to the gigaton scale, maybe. And if so, we can gobble up the last little bit of pollution, and that'll get us to net zero instead of actual zero. And that's kind of the goal for stopping climate change. One of the things that people forget, though, about climate change, especially tech investors, I don't know why, they're, they're supposed to be good engineers, but they forgot calculus class. Because climate change is a cumulative problem. Like the temperatures we saw in the world last year weren't just the result of last year's emissions. They were the result of the previous century or two's worth of emissions accumulating in the atmosphere. It's the area under the curve that matters most, not the curve itself. It's the integral that matters. Remember, you know, calculus 101. So again, the integral, the area under the curve, is what really matters when it comes to climate change. It's also what matters most when it comes to solutions. So for example, we could cut emissions in the next decade by maybe that much, preventing the blue area of carbon from ever going into the atmosphere. And if we cut emissions this decade, we can make that permanent, like phasing out a coal power plant, keeping a forest from being cleared, whatever it is. Then it might build up to be a much larger and larger total area under the curve, a much bigger impact over time. So cutting emissions this decade pays off not only in the coming decade, but the decades that follow again and again and again, accumulating into a very large impact. That's why early action pays off so much. 
And we can cut emissions again the next decade, cut them again the next decade after that. But the longer we wait, the narrower the window becomes to address climate change. You could just have less time. That's also why carbon removal is kind of an uphill battle. It's so small today. It's going to take a decade or two to scale. And then it only has a little window of time to really be effective. So when you do the math properly on climate change, it isn't the value at the end of the curve. It's the path under the curve, the whole area underneath it that matters most. So when you do that, you find cutting emissions is most of the story. It's 96% of the total answer of the integrals between those curves. And carbon removal is 4%. But cutting emissions in the first decade is about three quarters of the answer because it has three decades with which to work until the mid-century. So again, the idea of early action matters most of all. That's really, really important. And it tells us something that is really important, an idea you borrow from finance. <clears throat> You've all heard about the time value of money. Well, there's a time value of carbon, too, that early actions pay off a lot in the long run. So if you're trying to save for retirement, it helps a lot to start in your 20s and 30s and keep plugging away at that until you turn 65 or whatever. You don't wait till you're 64 and start saving for retirement. That won't end well for you. So same thing with climate change. What we need is what we can do now. So Project Drawdown, we always say time is more important than tech. And now is more important than new. So um, that's really important when it comes to addressing climate change. And this is why sometimes the fascination with kind of uh, shiny object tech solutions like fusion or carbon capture, advanced nuclear, that's nice. And Bill Gates loves this stuff. That's great. Let him do it, I guess. But it's not going to be all that effective. Because by the time these things turn on, if they ever do, there won't be a lot of time for them to actually work in the atmosphere. So it might be some of the lower tech things like insulating buildings retrofitting things, renewables we already have, things like that that actually can help you win this race. And if you want to win a race, it often helps to start running in it. You know, If you're sitting by the sidelines watching other people run by and it's like, I'm going to disrupt the sneaker industry. You know, Well, good, good, good luck with that. That's great. <laughs> but maybe you should start running. And if you get better sneakers along the way, go for it. But in the meantime, start running. That's why time is so important. The other thing that's important is it tells us how to not just allocate our work and climate solutions across sectors, but also across time. We're going to need to think about emergency break style climate solutions that could kick into the atmosphere like right now. Things that plug methane leaks, for example, that have a really fast impact on the atmosphere. Or stopping deforestation, which has a really fast impact on the atmosphere. That buys us some more time for other solutions like new infrastructure, nature, and those new technologies we might like for those to come in later, because those take time. So how do we make sure we're recognizing the time constants of different climate solutions to make sure we have a sequence of them, almost like passing the baton from one runner to the next to the next in this race against time? So that's going to be really critical as well. So when you think about climate solutions, I would err towards the ones that are ready to go now, because then they can start working. The other thing we need to think about is how to geographically focus our solutions, because what works in Austin may not work well in Portland, and what works in Portland may not work very well in Stockholm. So we need to figure out what solutions work best where you are, and deploy those, of course, but also look for kind of big opportunities to make a dent. For example, satellites now can pinpoint methane leaks from space. Now, the oil and gas industry knows all about these, of course, but they don't want to talk about it. But now that we have publicly available data where everybody can see a pipeline that's leaking methane or a refinery or a flaring event and make that, publicly no that public domain knowledge, we can name and shame the polluters. We can go regulate, find these guys. We can go there with a wrench and just fix it. And so why don't we go figure out where methane leaks are, other targeted geographic opportunities for climate action, whether it's a methane leak here or a deforestation event in the Amazon or things like this. Now new big data, geospatial information, even using AI to help kind of make this even better is really powerful information to help us really target interventions to the most important places we can go to right away. So let's not only be mindful of time, but also geography when it comes to being very effective with climate action. We also have to embrace learning curves. Uh, learning curves are a simple idea. The, the, the idea is the more we do something, we ought to get better at it. 
but that's not always the case. It turns out some technologies don't seem to get better over time, and others do. Let's bet on the ones that do. For example, big centralized kind of lumpy solutions where you spend billions of dollars at a time, uh, for example, nuclear power, they don't get cheaper with time. In fact, nuclear is the only energy source in human history that got more expensive over time, not less. So big lumpy solutions tend to get bogged down in red tape, bureaucracy, consultants, battles over labor and politics, permitting, all that kind of stuff. They take forever, too long, and get too expensive. Compare that to small, modular, granular solutions, things like solar panels. Solar is the fastest learning technology in human history. It's gotten cheaper faster than any energy source ever. And it keeps beating the forecast. It gets cheaper faster than even the optimist ever thought possible. Solar, batteries, LED lighting, heat pumps, electric vehicles, they're all following those kind of Moore's Law curves like an iPhone. So those are the solutions that are probably going to scale fastest and do so for the least amount of money and the shortest amount of time with the most amount of benefits. So again, think about which technologies you're betting on and which have had the best performance. But granular solutions that are built by the millions tend to be the best performing. So those are good things to bet on too. But along the way, as we think about climate solutions, I would encourage you all to think also much more broadly than just climate. And of course, that's the whole idea of Planet Texas is to think about people and climate together. So when I think about this, I wanna just show how much opportunity we have in this space. Just think about this, you know, fossil fuels are the single biggest contributor to climate change. Not the only contributor, but it's the biggest by far. But fossil fuels are also the biggest source of air pollution in the world besides greenhouse gases, particulate matter and smog and other stuff that we breathe. And it's estimated that about nine million people a year are dying prematurely on this planet today because of the air quality problems linked to fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are killing nine, people, nine million people a year. That's more than guns, tobacco, and warfare combined. It's the single deadliest product in human history. And we don't even talk about it. That's incredible. And most of the people who are suffering from this are going to be people of color, people in poorer communities around the world who don't have the same economic and political voice and power that some of us might have. So if we clean up fossil fuels from a climate perspective, you also did an incredible amount of good for public health, for human well-being, and for equity and justice around the world at the same time. And arguably, that's a whole lot more important. So why don't we think about climate solutions as being benefits to people in terms of health, in terms of the economy, jobs, but also in terms of equity and justice, which I think everybody cares about. But how do we figure out ways of doing this in ways that get the climate benefit and the human benefit at the same time? This is really critical, and there are just so many good examples of this, where climate solutions are just solutions to making a better world right away. These are really important lessons. And finally, when we do all this kind of stuff, remember I said, you know, there's no silver bullets, we have silver buckshot? Well, let's make sure the silver buckshot is aligned properly because we have to do things in the right proportions. We're gonna have to do lots and lots of different things, but how much of each? Well, science can help us here a little bit too. For example, this little bar chart tells us what we need to do to get to that net zero point around 2050 to 2060, at least as a globe. We've got to cut emissions and electricity and food and industry and so on in those rough amounts. And at the end, you know, some carbon removal, about 4% there. This is kind of the job, as science tells us, what we need to do. But now compare this to where we put our money. For example, here's uh, where we put philanthropic dollars, uh, like foundations and others that give money to uh, climate change efforts. Seems like my remote died here. Uh, so this is the kind of funding that goes into climate solutions and global philanthropy, which is about six to eight billion a year. It's pretty well aligned, but not enough in industry, not enough in food, this kind of thing. It seems you know, close, but not quite. Then we get to venture capital, which is a lot more money, and government funding, which is quite a bit more. But venture capital is really interesting. Uh, VCs put two-thirds of their money, about $90 billion a year, that's more than the government spends on climate tech, by the way, into just one category, electric cars and scooters. That's crazy, two-thirds of the money went to something that's maybe a five to 10% problem. Uh, you know, it's still important, don't get me wrong, but is this chasing impact or is it chasing uh, exits? It's chasing exits. It's chasing, oh, it's also chasing Elon Musk. 
It's chasing hype because that's what venture capital is really good at. Like wait for something to kind of get exciting, invest early, exit high. Who cares if it works or not? It just you make your money on the reputation of the company and its brand proposition. So you see a lot of you know different flavors of money do what they're good at. Uh, the Inflation Reduction Act here in the U.S., for example, is also doing some interesting things. Seems like it's way too weighted towards electricity at first, but this is just one moment in time. And the idea here is that it will invest in electricity first, which will then enable better solutions in buildings and transportation and industry later if we kind of green the grid. It makes electric vehicles, heat pumps, and all the rest a lot more attractive in the long run. So we need to kind of just keep an eye on this. In a given moment, maybe this seems kind of weird, but at the top of the uh, chart here is the North Star of what we should be doing in the long term is following the science and make sure the capital follows carbon and that we get the thing basically right. So make sure things are geographically aligned. So at the end here, science can move from just describing the problem to outlining at least theoretical solutions to then giving us instructions of how to do things. Science tells us to follow solutions that are grounded in good evidence, that are affordable and competitive with current economic opportunities, that are also ready to go and are able to accumulate impact filling in the area under the curve now instead of later. Also to geographically target our solutions to the kind of 80-20 rules, to the low-hanging fruits that are possible here today. Science also shows us that granular solutions that can be done by the millions have much faster learning curves and drop in price really quickly compared to big lumpy solutions that governments tend to favor. And then we also have to look at the co-benefits between climate action and human well-being so that we're not just looking through a tunnel vision at carbon, but looking rather at the whole problem of how do we want to build a world that is safe from climate change, but also more resilient and better in the future in many other ways. And then we align all of this effort and orchestrate it together so that we're following how the planet actually works, not just what we think should happen. And so this is what I think science has taught us on the climate mitigation side. And I think it's teaching similar things we'll hear about in the next few days on the adaptation and resilience side. Again, not just describing the problem. Academics were good at that stuff. But maybe abstractly doing an existence proof of possible solutions, that's good too. But we've got to go to the third step of the science of how. How do we actually do it and make it relevant so that action can be informed by good research and good evidence? And that's a lot of what I'm sure you're going to be doing here in the next few days too, which is fantastic. So what we have now is a narrow window of opportunity to address climate change. I think we still can do it, but only if we really, really pay attention to the science and do the best job we can do. In other words, we can still pull it off, but only if we follow the science very carefully uh, through that very narrow window of opportunity we still have left. Basically, we have to stick the landing every single time from now on. Okay, another thing we have to think about is not just the science zone. This is where I'm going to take off my scientist hat and just kind of talk from other experiences we've had at Project Drawdown. It's not enough to show people there are solutions. I think we also have to show people a dream of a better future, a world that is worth fighting for, a worth, uh, worth striving for and worth fighting for into the future. And we need to be inspired by dreams, not nightmares. And too much of our conversation around climate change seems to be this kind of nightmarish situation right now. We're being told that, you know, basically we're kind of screwed, that there's nothing we can do. Ask a lot of young people today about climate change, and they're really pretty freaked out and anxious about it. And I don't blame them, because that's all they've heard. But there is another side of the story. And if you're a little bit older, you remember other things where we, th you know, I'm Gen X, we thought we were screwed by the Cold War and that you know, we're all gonna die in a nuclear war. People before us were, you know, they thought they were screwed about something else when they were young. Every generation when you're young thinks the future is screwed. Well, guess what? It isn't always. Sometimes it's your choices that matter. Which future will you choose and go fight for that? So I would tell young people in the audience today, yeah, you think it's bad? Well, if you don't do anything, it's gonna be. But if we do something about it, it doesn't have to be, and we can change that future. So what we keep on hearing, though, on climate is that we're stuck in some kind of terrible nightmare of a future we have no control or agency over. That's not true. We're also told that um, we are stuck in some polarized kind of world that is absolutely terrible. That's not true either. We don't have to be in this world at all. It turns out that we're not necessarily screwed and we're not as divided as people would like you to believe. That's not true. 
so many people tell you that you know, half the country doesn't believe in climate change, the other half does, it's completely irreconcilable, there's nothing we can do about that. This is absolute nonsense. Here's what the data actually tell us. 90% of Americans actually believe climate change is real. Not 45 or 51%, it's 90%. So if you care, if you think you have to fight people to, you know, get them to believe in climate change, no, you don't. You take, you won a long time ago. Take the win and move on. This is already figured out. In fact, not only do 90% of Americans believe climate change is real, about 60% are really pretty alarmed and concerned about it and are leaning into the issue looking for something to do. But here's where the disconnect really happens. It isn't there. It isn't whether people believe in climate change or not. That's not an issue. I, honest to God, it's not. There are people who pretend not to believe in it, and there are some who stubbornly don't. OK, I'll give you. There are about 10% of Americans who really believe climate change isn't real. That's a smaller number than think that, you know, that's 10% that don't believe the Earth is round, actually. It's about the same number. It's often the same people, I think, um, <laughs> but I'm not sure. Uh, so, you know, it's not really worth your time to worry about it too much. So 90% believe climate change is real. The politicians may not say that, but they do believe it. And the disconnect isn't there. The disconnect is whether they care about it that much. So here's where the disconnect is. Again, most people believe it's real. But when you poll people and ask them, what do you, you know, maybe you believe climate change is real, but what are the things that are most important to you? And that we have a huge disconnect. It turns out only about 2% of Americans will list the environment as a whole, let alone climate change as a top issue. Only 2%. So this is the mistake we often make in the climate world. We might say, well, I'm in that 2% and I'm gonna try to convince the other 98% of Americans they're wrong and that my issue should be their top concern. Stop doing that, please. It isn't going to work. Instead, why don't we listen to the 98% of Americans who are telling us something pretty important? They're telling us what their daily concerns are, and tend to, they tend to be kitchen table issues, like jobs, like the cost of living, their community issues, like health and security, and what's happening in their towns, right? That's what always trumps the environment in every poll ever taken, ever. Listen to that. This is really important information, and guess what? They're right. And guess what? Climate solutions can help people with these things because climate solutions can actually create jobs. They lower the cost of living and inflation for a lot of folks. They're cheaper than fossil fuels. In places like Texas, they help stabilize your grid, which I hear has some problems. Um, you know, these are good things for you, whether you care about climate change or not. They also clean the air. They produce better, more walkable, better cities that are more resilient. They're better buildings, better homes, it's more comfortable. They also can address longstanding issues around equity and justice if you choose to do those wisely. So climate solutions aren't just climate solutions, they're just bloody solutions. So this is the evolution of my thinking over the years anyways. We, academics focused on the climate problem for years. Cross out the word problem and start putting the word solutions in there. That's good. And next, I wanna just cross out the word climate. Let's just talk about solutions. How do we make a better world that happens to lower emissions while we're at it? But most of all, and most importantly, it makes your community better. Just better. Don't call it sustainable. Don't call it climate smart. How about just use the word better? Because they are. Better is better. So when we do that, we find we can balance problems with solutions more effectively. We can meet people where they are instead of trying to convert 98% of Americans to be Greta Thunberg. Good luck with that. It ain't happening. We've been trying it for 30 years and it doesn't work. Stop, please and show that a better future is possible. And this is where dreams come in. You know, remember Martin Luther King didn't go around America saying, I have a nightmare. He talked about dreams and invited people to join him in building a better world. Now, we didn't fulfill his dream yet. There's a long way to go there, but I think the same kind of ethos will happen in climate change. Like, let me show you a vision of a better world that you can be part of. It isn't an environmentalist vision, it's everybody's vision. A world that is more prosperous, more secure, more equitable, healthier, and just plain better. That's a world everybody, everywhere wants, and I think we can build it together. So the last thing I think we need, besides science and better dreams, is we need heroes. We need people to step up and push and try and do everything possible, pulling all those levers, not just one. 
Uh, a lot of people come up to me, and probably up to all of you too, and especially young students will come up and say, what can I do to help with climate change? And I look at them like, I don't know, tell me what you can do. Oh, you're a nursing student, great, we're gonna need you. Oh, you're in education, we'll definitely need you too. You're an accountant, we need you. You're a lawyer, great, an engineer, a scientist, whatever, whatever, whatever. We need all of you. Every job is a climate job now. But go be a hero. Go do what you're good at, what you're passionate about, what you are visionary at, and be that. Be great at that, because we'll need every single one of you. We don't need just one hero, we need all of them. We need all of you. And I firmly believe that with all that, with good science, with some dreams and some real heroes, we have an incredible world within reach. We don't have to worry about that nightmare. We can dream of a better world and go build it, guided by good science. And I will always, always, always want to say this. It is not, not game over when it comes to climate change. It's game on, this moment, right here, right now, today. This is it, folks. This is when we get to make our choice. What world do you want? And what are you doing to build it? Because that's what's going to shape the future. So let's be bold. Let's be dreamers. Let's be guided by science. Let's find a better dream, a better story of the future. And you know, borrowing from David Bowie, let's be heroes, even just for one day. OK, with that, I'll stop here and say thank you. And I'll see if we have some time for conversations and questions. Thank you very, very much. So I guess there's some mics running around maybe, or uh, people want to. Could we start with maybe a student? Uh, these things, faculty tend to raise their hands first. And um, I used to be one of you. That, so, would it be OK? Would anybody mind if we started with some of the younger folks who are here, uh, maybe who, aren't, get, who haven't had a chance to speak as much over the years? Uh, it would be great if we don't mind. I'm sure we'll hear from everybody else, too. I'm drifting towards the back. Oh, don't be shy. Come on. You're, you're in Texas, you guys aren't shy. <laughs> I'm from Minnesota, we, you, you know how to tell an extrovert in Minnesota? He's staring at your shoes. Uh, okay, never mind. <laughs> I'll stick <laughs> the science of the jokes. <laughs> anybody? Okay, but forget the, anybody who wants to raise their hand then, forget it. I just wanna. There's a few up here. Uh, thank you for that talk. And um, the graph that showed where the bulk of emissions are and what the levels of investment are in the different categories, mm -hmm. it seemed like the biggest delta between the production and the investment was food. That's the biggest yeah. gap. Mm -hmm. What are you seeing that's encouraging there that you want to see more of? Or what can we do in Texas here toward that? Well, I'm really glad you asked about that. Um, so um, again, the numbers I was showing were global. Um, it turns out, this is kind of surprising to most folks, about a quarter of the world's greenhouse gas emissions from the world as a whole come from the food system, uh, mainly from deforestation, kind of cutting down rainforest to grow, for, uh, for more land to grow cattle and animal feed and palm oil for the most part, uh, but mostly driven by animal agriculture and, and oil palm. Uh, then it's methane from animals, uh, beef and dairy operations especially. Uh, methane production is huge there, and from manure. Uh, and a little bit from rice fields. And then overusing fertilizers is the third big area, which produces something called nitrous oxide, or N2O, which comes out of the soils. Uh, those are huge, and we don't talk about them nearly enough. And there's no real technology silver bullet for some of that stuff, like a solar panel or a battery. And so, um, strangely, those emissions are still climbing in much of the world, even in countries like the United States. I hope you all know this. The US is actually cutting its emissions and has been for about 20 years. We peaked our emissions back in like 2005, and they've been going down pretty much every year ever since through the Obama years and, yes, the Trump years and the Biden years, about the same every time uh, because of technology. But most of that was in electricity first. Soon will be transportation and buildings and a little bit after that industry, but our ag emissions are still climbing. And uh, we don't do enough around agriculture. The solutions we talk about in agriculture and food are food waste. 30 to 40% of all the food in the world is never eaten. So that means 30 to 40% of the emissions weren't necessary. 
let alone what goes to a landfill that adds an additional emission from the landfill sector. So food waste would be number one, but then diets, and that's where people get a little cranky, uh, especially in Texas or places like, oh, you know, I'm a vegan and I've come here to take away your burgers. You know, no, that's never gonna fly. Uh, but can we dial down beef and dairy a little bit, maybe? Um, it's interesting, only 12% of Americans eat half of the beef in this country. I'm trying to wonder, like, how are you feeling? <laughs> All right, <laughs> you know, like, do you really eat beef breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Oh my God, you know, maybe, maybe that's not so healthy. So it's not everybody, but maybe there's some disproportionate use that would have a health benefit too, maybe. So perhaps we could do something about that. Uh, but then it's also protecting rainforest, uh, especially in tropical countries, not so much the US, but other places, Brazil, Indonesia especially. Uh, and then farming better, so that means like less emissions from fertilizers and so on. Now there's a lot of excitement around what you'll hear called regenerative agriculture, um, which is pretty cool, but it's kind of a Band-Aid, uh, still a good Band-Aid when you're hurt. Band-Aids are good things, don't get me wrong. But it's not a tackling those primary emissions. Instead of getting rid of the cow, it says, hey, why don't we try to have the soils absorb carbon while the cow's belching methane into the atmosphere? So it's kind of like carbon capture, but with soils. Uh, it might, in certain circumstances, offset the cattle's emissions for a while, but the soils can only do that for so long and cows keep burping. So it's helpful and really good for other reasons, but it's not a silver bullet automatically. It may not always work everywhere forever. So just be a little bit careful there. But, um, and also it's really tempting to use it for greenwashing. To like, hey, I've got this great solution and it has you know, great pictures of farmers out there in a field. So it's very idyllic and has this kind of romantic appeal. But the numbers are a little bit you know, make you question it sometimes. So it's, it's good, but it, we need to look at all of this. We do, again, no silver bullets. So use regenerative ag and diet changes and food waste and better farming. Let's do and, and, and. Uh, but unfortunately in food, we don't have that conversation. And it's very hyper-politicized. That is an area where we are pretty divided by some special interest. Um, the energy sector, has a pretty powerful, I mean, you think big oil is bad? Wait till you meet big ag. You know, they, they own everybody, uh, Democrats and Republicans, uh, 100% right now. So it's kind of a tough conversation sometimes. But we need to have it. We need to have it. Hey, John, thanks for coming to Austin. Um, yeah. Good to see you. So you said evidence-based, cheap, ready-to-go, targeted, granular, beneficial, aligned. Mm -hmm. I would add. Please. Politically feasible to your point, and economically viable either now or really soon. Yep. So I'm, I'm interested to know if there are certain solutions that, that actually today you think we could scale like immediately, and, and what are you doing, what is Project Drawdown doing, and what can we do to make sure that those kinds of solutions get the collaborative action they need now? Yeah, yeah, I mean, um, I totally agree. I mean, that's part of, maybe it's embedded and not as explicit in the like cost-effective, you know, near-term and long-term, but near-term matters a lot to folks. And sometimes you need a little WD-40 to kind of get the thing going a little bit, and that's where like the Inflation Reduction Act, finally we figured out how to do climate policy right. Well, I don't think in America we're gonna regulate our way to greenhouse gases, we're gonna have to subsidize our way there. So giving people tax breaks for like, hey, the next time your furnace goes out, go get one of those fancy new heat pumps, and here's a little check to make it a little bit easier the first time. That's brilliant. It's gonna help incentivize, and heat pumps are now outselling furnaces and boilers in America. I never thought that would be possible even three years ago. And boom, it already is. Uh, EVs too, again, the subsidy helps a lot, but it's not necessary, but it helps. Boom, and they're growing faster than any, um, far faster than internal combustion engine vehicles, despite what the media will tell you, the EVs aren't selling. Uh, go look at the data. I don't know what press release they're just reprinting in the, in the media, but it's not true. EVs are booming right now. They grew 50% last year alone. That's insane. So uh, that, solar, wind, rooftop solar, things like this are doing really, really well. Um, but I would say, yeah, things like heat pumps would be the next thing. Um, but also ones that don't encounter the same kind of political resistance. And I don't care what side, you know, of politics somebody's on really that much. It's like, isn't it? Can we stop with the BS, you know, of like demonizing stuff as symbols? Like, I, I don't get it. Like, why did, you know, EVs have to become some culture war symbol now? And some, you know, we have to pick a side. Like, really? It's a car. They drive. 
you know, they're pretty cool. You know, I mean, so I think the things that don't encounter the same political resistance by the elected officials, but the real policy in this country when it comes to climate change is mainly made by 100 people you and I have never heard of. It's your public utility commissioners. It's your zoning board, it's your city officials. These are the people who actually run the world. Uh, the other people are getting all the attention. The people who really are gonna affect your life in Austin are gonna be the city officials, the PUC. Why Texas's grid is so flaky is not because of who's in the White House, it's because of local officials. Work on that stuff. And that's a little less polarized and a little bit more practical, I hope. Uh, so that's kind of been my experience. It's kind of working at the local level and the politics and at the um, how do we sell climate solutions, not on their green benefit, but on their just, they're just better. Um, you know, if you've ever driven an EV, you're gonna like, wow, this car really has some get up and go. Um, the, the, like car aficionados like them, that's great. Uh, Elon Musk was pretty smart about making Tesla's like a sporty car, not just a green car. And that helped uh, kind of win over the non-green kind of uh, divide, which I think is fantastic. Heat pumps work better than our traditional heating and cooling systems. Um, things that save you money, that make your life better. Again, let's just talk about better instead of greener. And I think you can win over folks. Um, and we've, I think, spent 30 years not doing that very well in the climate and environmental community. We tend to sell the green virtues, not just the economic and social virtues, like you're saying, like, hey, this is just a better way to do stuff. And that, that could work really well. Anyway. Um, so I'm going to kind of go back to the food question. So while greenhouse gas emissions are, you know, a third contributed by the food industry, mm -hmm. the actual, like, cost goes way beyond that. Mm -hmm. The quantified hidden costs of the food and agriculture sectors are, like, amounted to over $12 trillion. And most of that tab is picked up by other industries, uh, other industries like largely healthcare. Yep. Um, do you think it's a more effective messaging strategy to try to account for this by, as you said, going the green route, or do you think going to human health is more effective in reducing those? Uh, well, I, I mean, it's a personal opinion, but I think it's, you know, and you're alluding to it already, I think it's, you know, uh, maybe both, but probably the human health. I mean, everybody likes health. <laughs> you know, health is good. I think we can agree with that. Uh, so, yeah, when you point out that, you know, our food system, uh, not just in America, but worldwide, is failing a lot of people. Uh, it's also been a miracle, too, though. I, I, do, I, I do get sick of environmentalists kind of bashing farmers too much, or unintentionally, maybe. But the, the, there's a miracle in the world's food system that there are 8 billion people on Earth today, and 7.2 billion of us actually get nutrition every day pretty damn well. The food system does not meet the needs of about 700 to 800 million, but not because of farming. It's because of failed institutions and poverty. So, you know, I want to give a tip of the hat to our agricultural sector and the food sector has done a remarkable job that nobody thought was possible in the 1960s and 70s of feeding almost 8 billion people pretty well. That's kind of a technological miracle. So I want to be fair. But um, there are still people who are food insecure, about seven, 800 million, mainly due to poverty and failed governments and institutions worldwide. Yep, I'm going to address that, but that's not ag's fault per se, but it could be fixed. Uh, but then there are a lot of, there's an obesity epidemic, there's malnutrition still amongst people who are well fed calorically but not nutritionally. Uh, so there are health consequences to the way we feed the world today. Uh, and there are environmental consequences, not just climate, but water, water quality, biodiversity. In fact, I would argue food does more to this planet than the energy sector does when you look more comprehensively to like what, it, what we have for habitat, for water, water pollution, coastal oceans. They're all massive impacted by the food system. Uh, I wrote an article years ago called The Other Inconvenient Truth about like, you know, hey, the food system, you know, gobbles up 40% of the land on Earth, 70% of the water ever used on the planet is the biggest source of water pollution on Earth from nitrogen and phosphorus, and it's about a quarter or a third of greenhouse gases. Oh my God, but we still got to eat. So I think your point is, you know, yes, there's an environmental side, there's an economic side, and most of all, nutrition and health side, that probably will reach more people. But uh, it's a difficult thread you know, to, to figure out. I, the politics of it are really weird. There's a lot of power concentrations in this country and, and internationally of where, you know, why do we, you know, like, I live up in the upper Midwest and we're surrounded by like corn that doesn't feed anybody. It's ethanol and animal feed. And you know, for every acre of, it's weird, for uh, one acre of solar panels in Minnesota where I live could replace 100 acres of corn ethanol in terms of its power to the transportation system. So you could have one acre of solar panels and 99 acres of nature and still come out ahead compared to corn ethanol. That doesn't matter. 
it's still politically impossible to even have the conversation. And I think that's a shame. A democracy should have tough conversations. It might not get my way, but we all, can we talk about it? And it's almost impossible to do so. So that's a very long-winded answer to, I think what you asked is a great question, like how do we talk about these complex things? But I think just beating the environmental drum doesn't work when every Gallup poll ever taken for 50 years tells you only 2% of Americans will ever list an environmental issue at the top of their worry list. Jobs, health, security, community, that's always gonna be top. So talk in those terms. Listen to your neighbors, don't just preach at them. And I think health probably is the right angle to talk about it from, and, uh, and maybe rightly so. And it turns out they're, they're not incompatible at all. They can work together very nicely. Okay, there's time for like one more, or how are we doing? One or two more questions? Okay, great. Hi, I wanted to speak to the, the nightmare versus the dreamers. Um, you know, we know the brain evolved as a survival mechanism to pay attention to the negative, and so mm -hmm. we need a lot more positive. So I'm kind of wondering, besides yourself, um, you know, who, who are the other thought leaders that we can be following? Who's in your Instagram feed? <laughs> oh God, you don't want to follow that. Um, <laughs> uh, well, let me back up a little bit. I mean, I think we need to hear the tough stuff, like, ugh, you know, like it's, there's some bad news on climate change, absolutely, and not to be blind to that. I'm not suggesting, uh, a, you know, a Pollyanna approach, like everything's gonna be fine, don't worry about it. And um, that's not really true either. But I just wanna remind folks, like the world is usually, a, again, a balance between, well, it's going to hell or it's getting a lot better. And it's our choices that determine how much of each. And I'd like to think the it's getting better camp will win. Um, but we have to work hard at making sure it does actually get better. And But I do understand a lot of the so-called climate anxiety we hear a lot about and climate grief and this kind of thing. Of course, you know, it's like whenever you hear something bad, especially in this hypercharged kind of social media environment where those emotions are being manipulated, that's where I really feel sorry for young folks who are like, you, you realize you're being manipulated by an algorithm, and we all are, by politicians, by media, and even activists are manipulating us for money and clicks and power. That's not good for the world. So I try to offer that antidote you know, um, to that of like, hey, um, there are places to look for better. Uh, right here in Texas, Catherine Hayhoe is somebody a lot of you probably know. It's a real uh, heroine of mine, just somebody I think she's totally cool and very, very, very uh, good at connecting to people who might think differently than she does. So I really, really fall, uh, appreciate her a lot. Uh, it's also uh, Catherine Wilkinson, who's a former colleague of mine at Project Drawdown. She now leads something called the All We Can Save Project, which is a consortium of women climate leaders around the world. And uh, speaking with incredible authenticity and power and, and sophistication about uh, uh, leadership in a transformed era. And she's somebody I really respect in this way too. Uh, Kim Nicholas uh, is a former student of mine a long time ago, so a little, little um, connection there. Uh, she wrote a book called The, um, the Sky We Make, uh, which is also, I think, kind of a can-do, but very grounded, science-driven kind of uh, book. And she's a professor at Lund University in Sweden today, and she's really brilliant and a great author, too, so very readable. Those are some of the folks I would follow. Uh, Christiana Figueres who uh, helped negotiate the Paris Accords and was the ambassador from Costa Rica to the COP process. Uh, she's uh, really great too. She has a podcast called Outrage and Optimism because she said, that's how I feel every day. I'm sort of outraged by some stuff and then I'm wildly optimistic the other half of the day and I can't figure it out. But so she's honest about it and kind of, you know, uh, and she's really quite, uh, quite authentic but also really very, very sophisticated in how she talks about this stuff and very real and very, you know, raw. So yeah, those are some of the folks I, I tend to follow as, for inspiration these days. But you gotta find it where you can find it. And it's, whoever speaks to you, speaks to you. Okay, one last question, I guess. Is there, is there one more? Is there any more? Okay. Where are we? Did I see a hand? I'm sorry. Oh. Right. Oh, don't all fight it over the front mic. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, uh, similarly, on the, the list of attributes you had showed there, sort of three quarters of the way through, I might put a plug in for just the idea of right sizing mm -hmm. and less is more. I'm yeah. an architect, and so buildings <laughs> are my trade, yeah. and I'm kind of unpopularly thinking that we need to be very considered about how much we build and what we build and how big it has to be. Um, yeah. 
I mean, I'm also a Gen Xer, and I remember growing up in the Jimmy Carter era where you were supposed to turn off the light when you, <laughs> yeah. when you left the room and use less this and use less that. And yeah. if we even use less EVs because we walked, then we wouldn't need as much batteries and we wouldn't need to mine as much. And so I think we just really need to think it all the way through and um, include that kind of right-sizing idea and the less is more idea. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I, I find it, yeah, like you said, you kind of joke here, oh, it's a little bit of an unpopular message because it's about, like, you know, and it's the one that environmentalists get tagged with all the time, like, oh, you're the, the Jimmy Carter cardigan sweater guy who turns down the thermostat and turns off the lights and stuff. But if your parents grew up in the Depression, like mine did, that works because I'm Catholic and my parents grew up in the Depression. We're all about the guilt, you know? <laughs> so it's like, you know, you didn't leave a room without turning off the lights or you get yelled at and, you know, like you ate your vegetables, you cleaned your plate, you didn't screw around, at least in my household. So, um, but I think that, you know, sensibilities change and we're in an era of abund uh, abundance is an easier message to sell. But I think, you know, maybe efficiency um, is good. You know, I, I don't know. I mean, there's a really interesting, um, a lot of people may be following this too. There's a, there's a lot of um, environmental activists and scholars who talk about kind of degrowth. Um, it's like, hey, why are we growing the economy for its own sake? Maybe we should be looking to degrow the economy. Like, that's a terrible motto personally, but I think, how about just better? Can we just stick with the word better? You know, like we don't need to have just more crap, but maybe better lives. So maybe you don't need more stuff, you need more experiences or more quality versus quantity. I'm not sure how to message this. I think we need to, the problem is all the people who are so good at messaging this stuff work for Madison Avenue and they're trying to sell us all the crap. So we gotta, we gotta steal those people and have them help us figure out how to say what you're trying to say and what I'm trying to say a little bit more and make it an appealing thing. But I think it's about quality, it's about the spending time with people you love. It's about having rich experiences, not wanting but not over consuming and you know, having sufficiency and abundance but of the things that really matter. Um, and you know maybe we don't need all the little plastic gizmos that just get tossed away or a house we don't even use. Oh, I have a formal dining room I never use. You know, and, there's a great book, I mean, in your field too, there's a great book from the 90s called The Not So Big House by Suzanne Sosenka, which talks about like, hey, maybe we need more cozy, comfortable, high quality spaces in our home instead of these big McMansions with rooms we never even enter. And so, you know, this is a world that you all work in that's fantastic and really, really important. So I wish we knew how to kind of sell that a little bit better because, you know, quality life is more important than just a quantity of stuff. And I wholeheartedly agree, but we need to be heard and not, uh, you know, different different generations of different people hear that message a little bit differently. So we just have to be sensitive to that. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much for what you're doing here today and all the great work you have. And thanks for having me here for a little bit. And really enjoyed being with you today. Thank you.